breeze is cool, but it makes an interesting sound with the speaker. Uh, so if you guys need me to cut off my mic at some point in the sermon, let me know, and I'll transition. We're in the gospel and have been in the gospel of Mark a lot this past month. And today we are in chapter 5. Verses 21 through 43. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered round him, and he was by the lake. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came, and when he saw him, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly. My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so that she may be made well and live. So he went with him. And a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had, and she was no better but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha come, which means little girl get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. My sermonic title is Touched by Jesus. Touched by Jesus with the subtitle of they, them, they, them. A few years back, I was a kid at a baseball game. I'm not a baseball game, a basketball game. Uh, these two teams, that's kind of how it goes, were playing in a Catholic gymnasium. We're private uh, Catholic kids. I sat with the parents of the team of the kid I was supporting. The team mostly consisted of African-American boys. There were, however, two white boys on the team. One was doing pretty good, and he scored a shot, and I commented to the white parents sitting beside me, they must be proud of their son. They informed me that this was not their son. And the other white kid on the bench was not their son. Now, in that moment, my assumptions were revealed to me. And it reaffirmed for me how the assumptions we make about others sometimes is wrong. We make a lot of assumptions about people based on what someone wears, we make assumptions about them, or what they drive, or how they walk, or what kind of clothes they have on, or shoes, 
or what kind of phone or computer or how well they're able to articulate or not articulate, or where a person went to school, come on now, or how femme or masculine a person appears or how big or small someone. I was with someone the other day and they said that person shouldn't be eaten out. Assumptions. There are all sorts of ways in which we come to conclusions about people based on what we see. Again, assumptions sometimes can be wrong, and sometimes assumptions that we make about people can mislead us. A few years back when the whole personal pronouns endeavor began, I thought it was obviously clear who was a she and who was a he. Assumptions. But I was at some event with a lot of people much younger than me, and we went around and we introduced ourselves, and we were invited to state our personal pronouns. For the most part, people were as they appeared, and then it happened like duck, duck, goose. Remember that game? And there was, in fact, a person among us who was a she who was navigating her own change from one gender to another. My eyes and my ears perked up. Her story was interesting. It took a second, and it looked like she was telling us something that changed my vision. As our world keeps spinning and changing and growing and becoming more diverse, assumptions can be dangerous. This is where we enter the biblical text today. You can never just assume you know Jesus was in a crowd of folks and it was a lot of people like one of the festivals held here in Chicago, maybe the Taste of Chicago or the Art Festival prior to COVID. And there were a lot of folks and a lot of excitement and body contact and it was all sorts of people pushing up against one another and they were moving and trying to get somewhere. And in this tight crowd, Jesus asked, who touched me? And the disciples are like, seriously? Seriously, man? Like, you really going to ask who touched you with all these people bumping up against you? I mean, look at the situation. But Jesus was way deep. We get touched every day by people. We get touched by every day by others. But then there are people who touch us. Are you feeling me? I was watching a clip of America's Got Talent, and it was this lady, and she was really, really, really skinny. Remember how I used to look two years ago? I did see a picture of myself. She was skinny like me two years ago. But she had this really angelic spirit. Her stage name was Nightbird. And, you know, before the contestants sing on America's Got Talent, they usually ask them some questions about the person, and then they'll ask them, what are you going to sing? And she tells them, I'm going to sing It's Okay. And they are like, how are you doing? And she's like, I've got cancer in three places in my body. And they're like, so you're not okay. And she's like, but I am okay. And it's important for folks to know that I am more than the bad things that happen to me. You know, there are a lot of contestants that come on America's Got Talent. To, uh, got talent. There's a lot of talent out there and there's a lot of people who can sing. But some people's stories touch us. And then she begins to sing, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. If you're lost, we're all a little lost, and it's all right. And when she finishes singing, the audience is silent, kind of like you guys right now. And you know that everyone has been touched. And then she says, you can't wait until life isn't hard anymore to decide to be happy. I have a 2% chance of living, but that's a whole 2%. And everyone gets touched again. Jesus was like, somebody touched me. Because, yeah, we are always being touched and bombarded and shoveled around by life and people and situations. But then there are times when we are touched. We are really, really, really touched. Somebody, somebody, somebody touched me and he begins to look around the woman steps forth out of the saddle in her gender and her sickness and her desire for healing her personal pronoun she and her steps forth believing that if i can just touch this human divine maybe i can be whole if i can just press my way to this gathering 
I heard that Jesus was going to be in town. I've tried everything else. I've been to doctor after doctor. I've finished out my copays. I've done all I can. It seems like nothing did any good. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. But if I can just make it to this gathering, if I can just push closer and closer and see, don't fail me now. And she was within inches and no one would notice. And she didn't consult anyone and didn't ask anyone. She took her little feet and reached out and touched him. There, I did it. And now he knows. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, I touched you. He's asking who did it, and it was, it was me. Have you ever wanted something so badly? Really, really wanted something. I started watching last year this series called Pose, and it's, it's a show. <laughs> And it's a show about the transsexual and gay community in the 90s that was hit hard by AIDS. But what this show shows me, what it shows the audience is a community of people, gay and trans women, who are rejected by their families and the church. The need for belonging and family is so imminent in all of us that they recreate literally their own families with moms that have been assigned in their house. In the season finale, episode four, Take Me to Church, one of their own goes home because he is dying of AIDS. He has only so much time to live, and he decides that he wants to go back home and make peace with his family, make peace with his situation. And there's a part in the episode where his mom looks him dead in his eyes, and she doesn't want him to go to hell, and she says, do you believe in salvation in God? And he pauses for a moment, and then he responds, the way that you do, a big man that sits in heaven, no. I don't believe in that God. And his mom says, how is your God? And he says, my God is kind. My God is loving. My God is forgiving. My God is inside of me. People want God and people want healing. They want a kind, loving God to ease the pain of this life. Don't y'all want a loving God to ease some of the pain of this life? They just don't want to be judged and beaten upside the head with God. And this community wanted to be loved and accepted for who they are were, all of who they are while they were dying in record numbers. They want acceptance for who they are in their own bodies and with whom they love, just like the heterosexual community. It's not okay. A lot of folks have LGBTQ in their families, and they just don't talk about it. But that's just as bad as judging them. Perhaps the stories of this community during LGBTQ Pride Month touches us. Maybe the stories of those who have been kept out touches us. Maybe the stories of trans violence in our country at record numbers touches us. Maybe the stories of the LGBTQI leaving home to find home touches us. Maybe the stories of a dark time in our history where whole groups of people were left to die by themselves touches us a yearning for love and acceptance and no judgment and staying out of folks' bedrooms. Because consensual love is a matter of only those who are involved. Love is love is love is love. Maybe that touches you. This year I met a famous person in the LGBTQ world. They identify as neither gender with leanings toward female. You see, when they were born, they were born with both sexes. Their Baptist mom preacher had to make a decision which sex to raise the child as because we're so obsessed with gender conformity. And so the mom chose male. Welcome. And along, the boy went feeling different from other males. The size of his parts were significantly smaller and different. He was sick a lot. They were in hospitals a lot as a research case with doctors after doctors and residents pulling up gowns and looking and staring and talking right in front of him, them. And then puberty and breasts and lots of questions from classmates. And so they told their truth and their religious mom beat the crap out of him, them, saying don't tell our business. 
They could never understand growing up why God was so angry with them. And when they grew up, decided they wanted no parts of God. And addiction wasn't hard, but then that too wasn't enough to forget. And so they did the hard work of accepting all of their body parts and all of who they are and how God interestingly made them. And they have been on nationally syndicated shows and all over the world sharing their story, creating space for other people who are born intersex. You see, the lines are blurry and we've rejected and harmed a lot of folks in the name of what was passed down to many about what the Bible says and maybe, just maybe, we've done enough harm and maybe some part of the human story of rejection and pain can touch us. Because most LGBTQ people have a story to tell if you're willing to listen and be touched. Jesus acknowledges this woman's touch. He acknowledges her journey. He calls her from seclusion out into the open. People should be able to live out and in the open. And he doesn't berate her or judge her or condemn her. He was on his way to heal a girl child. And yet here a fully grown woman is in need as well. He was surrounded by needs and sickness and hurt and pain just as we are today. And with all that was happening around him, people pushing and shoving and people wanting something from him and the disciples traveling with him, all of this energy around him, he notices the one who has touched him. And he says to her, your faith has healed you. Go now in peace. Meaning you are well and alive. Live your best life. The healer has seen you and felt you and your faith has healed you. And it's okay. It's really more than okay. We all get lost. It's all right. You are okay. I hope during this Pride Month that the LGBT community stories will touch us. Let us be compelled by the stories of people on the margins. No judgment. My friend Dave Jackson and his wife were staunch evangelicals. And then their daughter fell in love and married a woman. They were devastated. And for sure, they prayed for him. And for sure, they were touched, but not in the way maybe we wanted them to be touched. And they realized they loved their daughter. And they could see that this relationship was as solid as theirs was. And it was an agonizing journey, but every year in their Christmas pictures, they take pictures of everyone, including their daughter and their daughter-in-law. And they found a way to love and accept their daughter and daughter-in-law, but it wasn't without struggle. So I got a burning question for my heterosexuals in the community. When did you choose to be heterosexual? Did you wake up at 16 or 17 and say, yeah, I think I'll go with the people of the opposite sex? When did you choose it? Because often we say about the LGBTQ community that they chose that. They didn't have to choose it. And so why wouldn't it be any different for the LGBTQ community as it is for heterosexuals? It just is who they are. Maybe they didn't choose it. It just is who they are. And maybe we can be touched by their humanity, except that years of trying to suppress who one really is is not healthy. Let people tell you who they are and believe them. Let people tell you their personal pronouns, and it don't matter how they look, just respect it. You ain't got to figure it out. Let people share their truth without needing to change them, quote scriptures, or beat them over the head. Let's deal with our own baggage, and don't put that on folks who are pressing in and want it to be loved and accepted and whole. Let people touch you without fear of contamination because they have been traveling and hurting, and they need to touch others. Now today I spent most of my time talking about the woman touching Jesus, but in the end, Jesus also touches her. Not literally. I mean, read the text. You see, touching is never a one-way road. When we gather today, which was what made COVID so hard, we touch one another just by our presence even though we never literally have to touch one another, we touch one another. 
and many people were touched by Jesus' ministry, not literally, but touched, because that's how community works. This woman left better than she came. We are back together today, and no doubt we will touch each other. It's a beginning. Not everyone is here, but a lot of us are here. And we see all of you on Facebook and Zoom and YouTube too. May we touch each other with this beautiful community of diversity where we can be as different as the fingers and as whole as the hand. It is my hope for us that we are always being touched and moved and transformed. And I hope just a little the lives of the LGBT community touch us in such a way that we intentionally make room. Room doesn't happen. We have to do that by intention. That we intentionally make room for she, her, he, him, and they, them, and all of God's children under the rainbow. Amen.